Um, Hana, please put all attendees in mute mode. Presenters, put yourself in mute mode. And I'll wait till I see that happen. Uh, we're recording, so you're good to go. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot to cover within this two hours. Um, first of all, welcome everybody to the 2013 JRD Editorial Board Meeting webinar. Um, the team and I uh, spent a lot of time trying to figure out the best way to host this meeting to allow it to be interactive yet informational, and this is what we've come up with. Um, Hannah, next slide, please. These are the webinar housekeeping notes. Currently, you are muted. Um, at the end of each section, we will open it up for questions if there are any. During the talks, if you would like to present a question, you can either raise your hand or type a question. If Hana is able to answer the question immediately, she'll send you a reply, and if not, she will save them, and at the end of each section, you will be unmuted to be able to ask your question, and if more people would like to participate, they can raise their hands, and they can also be unmuted. Um, I think that's about all. What we're going to do here is during the question period and at the introductions for each of the speakers, the webinars, uh, the, cam the webcams will be on, so you'll be able to see us, but during the talk we found that the webcams can be a little bit distracting, so during the actual presentation, speakers will turn off their webcam, which is what I'm going to do now. Next slide, please, Hannah. Okay. Today, uh, in this webinar, we're going to be focusing a lot on the then and now. Uh, we're celebrating our 50 years of publication this year with our 50th volume. And we, in order to uh, celebrate this, we have created the Then and Now Project to highlight research publications from 48 to 50 years ago compared with current day thinking. Um, we have 10 Then and Now publications corresponding to the 10 issues from nationally and internationally recognized rehabilitation specialists. Next slide, Hannah. But before we talk about that, I'd like to say thank you to VA Central Office because we were honored to receive a shout out on Hey VA. This is something that if you are within the VA system, when you turn on your computer in the morning or whenever you turn on your computer, um, you'll receive notifications from the VA and this particular notification went out to all people affiliated with Central Office and it spoke about our Then and Now project and the first article written by Dr. Lucille Beck, who is head of the VA Prosthetic and Sensory Aid Service, where she featured a commentary on 65 years of progress in that service, and it was compared back to the original article that you'll see in the next slide. Next slide, Hannah. Um, on this first slide, you'll see here 20 years of progress in auditorial originally written by Dr. Robert Stewart along with the commentary by Dr. Beck. In issue volume two, the original article was by Edward Pizer et al. and the commentary was provided by our own Dr. Rory Cooper. The third volume of this year was an article by Anthony Staros again with commentary by Dr. Stephen Gard, one of our own. Next slide, Hannah. For volume four, an article again by Pizer with commentary by Dr. Ron Triolo, one of our own. 
The next two article, next two issues, volume five and six, feature guest editors, Dr. Joan Sanders and Dr. Yat Van Netten and Klaus Postima, and there will be four more following. Next slide, Hannah. The concepts we're going to cover today are thus. I'm going to talk about the JRID mission and the JRID global significance. After that section, I'll follow it up by some of our editorial stats, our policy updates, and your final opportunity to vote for artwork from the National Veterans Creative Artwork Project to grace the covers of the 2014 issues of JRD. Following those discussions, Mr. Dave Barlinski, our webmaster, will give you our latest web stats. Mr. Tristam Horm, one of the copy editing team, will discuss our recent um, problems as well as our solutions to some of the plagiarism issues we've encountered within the past year. Ms. Marin Rosenberg, the JRD managing editor, will discuss our forays in with the GPO bookstore and Zinio. Ken Frager, our public affairs officer, will discuss our social media enterprise. Finally, I will follow up with our new initiatives. We'd like to extend at this time a very special thanks to Hannah Gribble as the webinar coordinator. And she's the one who will be taking your questions and holding them until the appropriate time. Next slide, please. JRD mission and global significance. Next slide, please. The JRD mission, I reiterate this at the beginning of every JRD editorial board meeting. Our mission is to responsibly evaluate and disseminate scientific research findings impacting the rehabilitative healthcare community. So recently I was asked, why does JRD need to be an international publication? To answer this question, I will briefly discuss salient points from two recently published articles. Next slide, please. But before I discuss the international implications, I'd like to point out that after more than a decade, JRD can finally be located from the VA main page. If you type in JRD in the search box on the main page of the Department of Veterans Affairs, this is the page you will see. And we are quite pleased that we are now officially a searchable item within um, the VA infrastructure. Next slide. The first article I'd like to discuss is by Jay Adams from a recent Nature publication entitled The Fourth Age of Research. In this article, he talks about how research has progressed over the centuries, starting with research by an individual, with communications between individuals comprising mainly of letters. Progressing to research through an institution, followed by research through national collaboration, and what he considers to be the present day state of affairs, research driven by international collaboration. Next, next slide, please, Hannah. The second article by C.L. Smith from the journal Collaboration, an Elsevier publication, takes a look at the growth in international collaboration from 1996 through 2008 with respect to their proportion of national publication output. This figure shows the growth in international collaboration for selected countries, and the countries are um, in the key box to your right, and the proportion of national output that this represents from the time frame I previously mentioned. The dash in each of these graphs, each of these little squiggly lines effectively, represents the starting point of 1996. The arrow represents the data point at 2008. What you see here is that the proportion of national publication output produced in collaboration with other countries tends to generally increase over time 
And you can see here for the United States that it's gone from 50,000 to close to 100,000 as the percentage of collaboration with other countries increases. So therefore, international publication and international collaboration create greater growth and leads to increased quality as measured by the number of times a particular paper is cited. What does this translate into? It translates into increased recognition, prestige, and in rehabilitation, our field, utility to other researchers, and ultimately to patients. Next slide, please. Back to the article by Jay Adams and what he did. Mr. Adams took a look at the Web of Science articles published between 1981 and 2012, which comprised 25 million papers, and he tallied the author addresses by countries. He then proceeded to calculate the balance of international and domestic research collaboration for the U.S., U.K., Germany, France, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. And then he probed the relative citation impact of purely domestic versus international research in publications. Next slide, please. This is one of the graphs from his article. And this sh slide shows that articles with papers with at least one author from another country are cited more than purely domestic work. And in this case, he's comparing 2001 and 2011 for the US and the UK. So what you can see here is the increase is due to international collaboration. On the next slide, please, Hanna. His findings are that domestic publication output across STM, which throughout this um, talk today, STM is scientific, technical, and medical publications, has flatlined in the U.S. and Western European countries. The rise in total annual publication output for each country is due to international collaboration, while the percentage of papers that are entirely homegrown is falling. In emerging economies like China, and we reported on this last year, domestic output is expanding as increased research dollars are going into heavily domestic programs. Next slide, please, Hannah. So what does this mean for JRD? In 2003, the then, we had 20 different countries submitting to JRD. Now, in 2013, we have 36 different countries. JRD has become an international leader in rehabilitation publication in large part due to submissions from articles with authors from other countries. And one of the things that we'll be emphasizing throughout this talk is that the global rehabilitation research that we publish is very beneficial to our veterans. Next slide, please. Another thing that we're going to take a look at with respect to then and now and country of origin is access. We have been recently, since 2011, been able to track JRD web online access by countries. Mr. Bartolinski, our JRD webmaster, will be speaking a bit more about this later. But briefly, in 2011, 91 countries came to the JRD website to access content. In 2013, we are up to 190 countries. Again, this reflects the need for international collaboration and international research. Next slide, please. The take-home message. JRD's role as an international publication is vital in rehabilitation research so that the publication truly reflects the most cutting-edge research on behalf of veterans as well as people around the globe. I would like to point out that while we tend to think of veterans as being primarily a homegrown kind of thing, they're in the United States, 
There is the Foreign Fee Program, which supports veterans in other countries who have service-connected disabilities. And they are serviced not by VAs, but by local doctors and facilities around the world. And one of the things that we are able to see is that a lot of our research is downloaded by major medical institutions in countries around the world. So therefore, JRD is VA money well spent. Next slide, please. At this point, I'm going to turn back on my webcam. Hannah, have we received any questions on any of the salient discussion points that I've presented? Uh, no questions so far, and it doesn't look like anybody's hand is raised, so. Okay, then we will proceed. I'm going to shut off my webcam. Okay, proceeding onward. Editorial stats, policy, and veteran artwork, the next section to be covered. Next slide, please. Hold on, we just got a question. Um, Dr. Triolo asked, has the JRD impact factor increased in proportion to the number of countries listed? Hi, Ron. Um, I'm going to actually be showing that really, really soon as part of the editorial stats. And um, I think you'll be able to see that overall, our citations have gone up substantially in the last decade. You'll see that very soon. Thank you. It was a great question. Any others, Hannah? Doesn't look like it. OK. OK. We're going to be focusing a lot on then and now to, to be able to give people frames of references, frame of reference for how far we've come. The JRD Reviewer Database, which um, the JRD Reviewer Database these days is comprised of people who review for us as well as people who have submitted articles for consideration. And then a lot of times these people are oftentimes asked to become reviewers themselves. In 2002, there were approximately 225 reviewers in the paper file. In 2013, we have over 5,000 active reviewers in the Manuscript Central database. That's quite a substantial increase. And we keep adding additional reviewers every single year. Next slide, please. We've also seen a dramatic increase in submissions between then and now. In 2003, we received 145 initial submissions. In 2012, we received 248. Our projection for this year is 300 plus. Now please note that these are only initial submissions. Between various revisions for this past calendar year, 2012, Lloyd and I handled more than 750 papers. So as a note to all of you, you'll forgive me if I don't remember exactly which paper you're talking about. So Lloyd uh, is very insistent on always knowing the number, and there's a, obviously a reason for that. Next slide, please. Our rejection rates have also continued to climb. Rejection rates are somewhat variable, depending on the time frame from whence they were calculated. In this particular case, for 2012, it was calendar year 2012, and for 2003, it was the first year that JRRD was in Manuscript Central, and again, it's a calendar year. And this includes all submissions, even revisions. And as you can see here, our rejection rate has practically doubled within a decade. And, but again, that just slightly, I mean, the numbers vary just a little bit um, depending upon the time frame calculated. So you can realize that if you're calculating over a calendar year, you are not just calculating the papers that were submitted during that year, but you're also calculating based on papers received in the previous year. That's why the rejection rate is a little bit variable. Nevertheless, we are rapidly approaching 60% rejection. Next slide, please. Likewise, the impact factor has also doubled. 
Um, in 2003, we were 0.7. In 2013, we're 1.4. The five-year impact factor, where the first year that this was accessible um, through the JCR, was 1.785. This year, it was 2.357. Um, many years ago, in 2008, um, our website was offline for a year, and that year off is still affecting slightly our five-year impact factor, although it no longer affects our two-year impact factor. So we're quite pleased to see that the impact factor is steadily increasing, as it should be. And to answer your question, Ron, it's hard to know exactly what the exact contribution of international versus national is, but you will be able to see from the next two slides that this is affecting our citations. Hannah, next slide. This is a graph from SJR, which is the Scientific Journal's ranking. This comes from SEI MAGO, and SEI MAGO is an algorithm that was developed from Google PageRanks. The, in, in this particular graph, what you see are citations tabulated during the previous three years for JRRD and other clinical medical based STM publications. And this has been seen as the minimal time for the tale of research, although for JRRD and other rehabilitation journals, the tale actually extends out to six years. Nevertheless, people citing JRRD have grown substantially while JIRD authors citing their own JRD self-cites has remained constant. So um, the then is hovering over 2002-2003, which is around 300. The now is a slightly above 700. But more importantly, what you can see is the self-cites, the little maroon bars, have more or less remained constant. Next slide, please. Again, another graph from SJR, and this graph shows a journal citable versus non-citable documents. This is done also in three-year increments, although they're averaged over three years for articles published in JRD, again. Um, so what you can see here is while the number of citable articles has substantially increased, the number of non-citable items has more or less remained constant. And so that, that's really important because that means that what we're publishing here is all fully accessible from PubMed and is fully citable. Um, we're not publishing a lot of commentary. We don't, have a, we don't have any fluff and we don't have any of the other content that is available in some of the top tier journals. Nevertheless, one of the things that you will see um, when Mr. Frager, our public affairs officers, talk, is how we are making forays into getting other material that are related to JRD content out through our social media. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing that. So more people are citing JRD and more articles are citable. Next slide, please. I think this quote speaks volumes over the progress we made. This quote came in not too long ago and was one of the ones that had uh, the team chuckling. And the quote said, sheesh, this is getting discouraging. Let's drop back to a lower level journal, maybe PLOS. I think this quote says a lot about how far we've come. Next slide, please. I mentioned the 2014 National Veterans Creative Artwork. This, um, we have a Flickr page, and on our Flickr page, you can see the pieces of artwork that are out there for your consideration and for your vote. After this talk, um, this presentation will appear on the JRRD website under, under uh, PowerPoints, and, or you can directly click off of here and you can link out to the Flickr page and then email your five choices to Ken Frager by Monday close of business if you've not already done so. Next slide, Hannah, please. The 
This shows you um, what our Flickr page looks like. So in order to figure out what the number of this artwork is, each artwork has a number or a description so you know what to mail to Ken, you hover your mouse over the image to get the number or name to create your top five list. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, our last bit of editorial commentary. One of the things that uh, I routinely do is to make sure as a U.S. government publication that I try and keep us out of trouble. Um, on the 30th of April, 2013, the U.S. Office of Foreign Assets Control Division of the Treasury Department mandated that journals can only publish articles authored by non-governmental scientists from Iran and other sanctioned countries. Um, several years ago, um, there was, under the trade embargo, we were not allowed to publish any articles from Iran or other, quote, quote, axis of evil countries. That ban was lifted, and now this provision has been put in place. Um, Mr. Tinker checked all JRD submissions, either under review or in the post-production queue, and found no articles that violated these sanctions. Obviously, we will continue to monitor papers as we receive them to make sure we are in accordance with this federal policy. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to turn back on my webcam. Hannah, did we receive any questions? Um, no questions regarding your, um, your talk. Uh, I'm not sure if, if you answered Dr. Triolo's question because he's no longer in the webinar. Um, okay. Lloyd passed on a couple of things. Um, some people were, were wondering why they're in listening only mode. That's because if too many people's microphones are open at the same time, it slows down the amount of data that's being transferred through everybody's internet and makes everybody's internet really, really slow. So I just sent out a, a chat message, but, I'll, but just please remember, if you do have a question at any time, you can either type it into the question panel and I'll respond to it immediately or I'll make sure that whoever's presenting um, gets to it or, uh, on the side of your little GoToWebinar panel, there's a little button that has a hand on it. If you click that, it'll all get a notification that your hand is raised, and I will make sure that you get unmuted and get the chance to ask your question. So just a, a reminder there. Thank you very much, Hannah. Anybody else have any questions before we transition to our web stats? It doesn't look like it. Thank you. I'm going to turn off my webcam. Um, Mr. Bartlinski will now speak to you. Most unfortunately, he does not have webcam access, so you won't get to see Mr. Dave today, but you'll get to hear his voice and his story. My webcam is off, and I'm going into mute mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Bartlinski, and I'm the Department of Veteran Affairs Rehab Research and Development Service and JRD's webmaster. Now I'm going to briefly talk about JRD's website performance then and now and what we are predicting for the future. Next slide, please. First, the Rehab Research and Development and JRD's website are hosted by the Austin Information Technology Center. And all analyzed data I will show you today is provided by WebTrends, which is also hosted and maintained by AIPC, and Google Analytics. Next slide, please. This graph illustrates JRD content downloads from 2004 through 2013. As you can see, we're continuing to increase our downloads from year to year while marching toward 10 million. Last year at this time, we projected out through the end of 2012, estimating to finish the year with 7.4 million downloads. And I'm happy to report we finished the year with over 9.6 million. This large increase is partly due to a spike in traffic in May and June. However, based on trends we have observed over the past years and the current data we have so far, 
we are estimating to finish 2013 with 9.5 million downloads. Um, also note, there is no data for 2008 because JRD was offline. Next slide, please. Now back in 2011, when we were first able to track and collect location data on our website's visitors, we were being accessed by 91 different countries. Next slide, please. And now, at my last check, we're being accessed by 193 different countries. Next slide, please. In 2010, we made a large effort to increase the amount of content we had available online. Now we're really starting to see remarkable results. This slide outlines some of the supplementary materials that are available only online. In 2010, we began to distribute video provided by authors as supplementary material through YouTube. And in 2010, we had 3,337 views. And now in 2012, we have over 9,000. In 2010 was the first full year of data that we have on the use of our RSS feed, and we averaged 1,481 views per month in that first year. And now in 2012, we're averaging over 8,000 views per month. Also, our PowerPoint image slides and slideshows took off when we first made them available in 2010 and averaged over 2,000 views per month and now we're averaging over 7,000 with a total of 85,779 downloads in 2012 alone. Um, JRD, at a glance, that accompanies each article that we began making available translated into Spanish in 2010, greatly surpassed our expectations in popularity. And now, in 2012, they were viewed over 2,600 times. Um, we also recently began making the same at a glance content available translated into both traditional and simplified Chinese. And to date, we have had over 6,000 views. Our podcast was also accepted into iTunes in 2010 and had nearly 10,000 views, resulting in almost 8,000 episode downloads in that first year. Now we have over 17,000 views resulting in 26,861 episodes downloaded. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates further Charity's website performance overall then and now, showing increases from 2010 through the end of 2012. Average visits per day have increased by 500, and the average visit duration or the amount of time that a visitor stays on our site has increased to nearly 50 minutes, telling us that the majority of our visitors are staying on our website to read full articles. Page views have also shot up to over 7.1 million, or 19,000 per day. Website hits reached an astonishing 30 million in 2012. That's 84,000 per day, or roughly one per second. Our mobile device traffic has increased to 6.5%, partly due to the increase in popularity of mobile devices, but also our push to make sure that our content is available on all platforms. Next slide, please. Charities website traffic sources. Google remains number one source of all referrals, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. PubMed also remains the largest second source of referrals of any scientific, technical, and medical journal indexing service. And direct traffic or any traffic that is not the result of another site linking to us accounts for 15%. And now the main VA website, which links to us, um, accounts for 4% up from last year, um, possibly due to the increased exposure. And then other alternate search engines kind of round out the top 10. Next slide, please. Um, going forward, we're going to continue to look for ways to increase our website traffic. And we're going to push all of our content for worldwide dissemination. 
Um, we're going to continue to create and repurpose charity content for the web. We're going to continue to enhance our user experience. And as we go, we're going to adapt our efforts to what website trends and data suggest. Uh, I want to thank you all very much and ask if there are any questions. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Um, however, Dr. Triolo did come back. Um, Stacy, do you want to talk about? Or are you? Can you revisit the impact factor later while he's while he's here? Um, or do you want to do that now? It, it's up to Dr. Triolo. Ron, did I answer your question? Hold on, let me unmute him real quick. Okay, Dr. Okay. Triolo, you're unmuted. Yeah, Stacy, we can revisit this later. I don't want to interrupt the flow of the presentation. Okay, we can, yeah, we're going to have definitely have an open discussion at the end um, to allow people to bring things forward. Just be sure you, that you put up your hand so that Hannah knows to unmute you. Sure. Okay, great. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. At this point, we're going to turn this webinar over to Tristan Horam, one of the copy editing team, and our plagiarism sleuth, who will discuss the findings on plagiarism. All right. Hello, all. I am Tristan Horam. I'm one of the technical writer editors here at JRD, and I am responsible for checking all of our articles for plagiarism before they move forward in the production process. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of our plagiarism policies for 2013. So if you can go to the next slide, please. All right, the way we check for plagiarism, every article is run through the Authenticate, which is a plagiarism detection program, during the production process before the article is edited. Any paper in which plagiarism is found will be immediately rejected and will follow the Committee on Publication Ethics procedures. Those procedures might include communicating with department heads or funding sources if necessary. For cases of self-plagiarism, where using text or data or whatnot that have appeared in a paper by the same authors, the author is contacted and given four options depending on the nature of the duplication. Those options are to paraphrase the text and add a citation to the original, to put matching text in quotation marks and add a citation to the original, to refer to the original publication without repeating the text, or to include a properly cited appendix with the relevant text for online publication. Now, which step we take with each author depends on what has been copied, the original source, and any other extenuating circumstances. So with some authors, we allow them to rewrite sections and proceed to publication, whereas for other papers, we need to remove the duplicated text and we just use a citation to where it was originally published. Then after an author has sent a revised manuscript, the article is run back through Authenticate to check to make sure that the changes are sufficient. So next slide, please. All right. Since the last editorial board meeting, I have run 130 articles through Authenticate. Of those articles, 13 were found to have some form of self-plagiarism or duplication. Luckily, we, have, we did not come across any direct plagiarism of other sources, so we'll keep our fingers crossed that that trend continues. Of those 13 articles, most we were able to work with the authors to keep to uh, resolve the problem and move forward and still publish the articles. We did have one article that we rejected after checking with Authenticate because we found what we call salami slicing of the research. Basically, after looking at the paper, we determined Stacy and I did that the article was using the same experiment or this, the same research from a previous article and just par 
parsing it to try to get more publications. So the article did not seem to be adding anything new that the previously published article had not presented, so therefore we rejected it. We will continue to check everything we publish beforehand to make sure that we are only providing the highest quality articles. And go to the next slide, please. Last year, we published an editorial in issue 49.8 detailing our new policies and how exactly we checked for plagiarism and dealt with it when we found it. The link to, the, to that article is at the bottom of this slide. And so for any more information, that article covers most of what we are doing. So we'll turn it over to questions now. Um, Dr. Jutai has a question. So Dr. Jutai, you are now unmuted. Go ahead. Hello? If you want, you can go ahead and just type it in if you're having problems with the microphone. Uh, he says, uh, regarding self-plagiarism, how is it determined in multi-authored papers? So when we run an article through Authenticate, any matches that we find, it, it will give me a link to the article that's been, been matched. So then I go into that article and compare it to the manuscript we're, we're looking at, I, I look at the author list for both papers and if I find that some or all of the authors were the same on both papers then we consider it self-plagiarism rather than plagiarism of others. Yeah, let me add a comment to that. Um, it's, it's somewhat rare, um, but it, it's somewhat rare that any two papers that will come in will have the exact same author list. So um, when Tristan and then Tristan or I take a look at this, um, as long as we find some sort of general concurrence of the same authors or especially a PI, um, we will consider that self. Does that answer the question? So basically we look at each article that comes up as a f flag in the authenticate checker on a case by case basis. Once I see, we see that there might be matching, we look into the actual articles and the matches and make that assessment ourselves rather than relying on the program to tell us with percentages. Yeah, because people often ask me when we, go, when we go to STM conferences, what percentage do we use? There's no, like if in a lot of universities, they, 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 sent, they set a percentage. Your paper cannot have more than 25% similarity with another paper. We, we don't do that. Um, what we do is we take a look at the amount of duplicated material itself, and we run from there. In, in some cases, especially if you're doing an experiment that is very, very similar to a previously published one, um, you're going to have words that overlap. Um, and what we do is that we take a look at those words and what they're referring to and we go forward from there. Um, oftentimes the words cannot be changed, especially if they're within a method section. Other times, like Mr. Horan referenced, we give people the option of doing four different things and, and primarily we see these problems within method sections and sometimes within introductions. Um, we give people options for how, how to fix it. But just know that um, when this happens, 
leaving it as is is not going to happen. Um, we, we have to be very, very careful because um, other publications own copyright. At JRD, because we are government publication, unless an author specifically takes out copyright, and again, this has to be a non-governmental author, and up until this point in time, no author has ever specifically asked for copyright, we have to be very careful that we are not infringing on the copyright of any other publications. Okay, he said um, that yes, thank you, it answered his question, so we can continue. Thank you, Tristan. Right. On the next slide. Okay, at this point, um, we're going to turn the talk over to Ms. Rosenberg, our managing editor, and um, she's going to report on new dissemination tools. Hi. <laughs> Excuse me. Hi, I am Marin Rosenberg, and I am the JRD Managing Editor. I'm going to talk to you for a little bit about our GPO Bookstore and Zinio dissemination programs. And I'm going to turn my webcam off now and continue the presentation. So our question here was, how can we make our digital content available as broadly as possible? How can we make JRD articles easily accessible through mobile devices, the iPad, the iPhone, tablets? Um, as you can see from this slide, it can be pretty complicated. There's, there's the Apple operating system, there's Androids, we now have the Windows phone, and coming up pretty soon there's going to be HTML5. Um, a lot of these things have different requirements, different screen sizes, different resolutions. Um, so what we decided to do is we, we talked to the government printing office. They, they handle our printing. Um, and they have a partnership with a company called Zinio and we decided to go and partner with GPO and Zinio. Um, next slide, please. So what is Zinio? Zinio is the world's largest newsstand. It is a digital magazine, website, and application. They were founded in 2001 and are based in San Francisco. They've got more than 5,000 brands from more than 1,000 consumer publishers. They are in 20, 206 countries and 33 languages. But what was exciting for us was that they're available on almost all devices. They're available on your PC, on the iPad, on the iPhone, on all of the different screen sizes on the Android. Um, they're available on the Windows 8. And starting in January, they're going to be available in HTML5, which is a, an interesting development. And you can read a little bit about they've won some awards for the best global app and best app ever. And the Huffington Post says, to see magazines done correctly, look at Zinio. So next slide, please. <clears throat> In January 2012, we started publishing JRD with Zinio. And this is a screenshot of the reader application on a PC. Um, it is a similar look and feel on the iPad, on the iPad <clears throat> and even has a similar look um, on your iPhone. And what Zinio has done is created containers for each of the devices so that you download the application on your device and it has a container that, that allows you to turn the pages, it allows you to click links, it displays the content. And those, each reader is optimized for the settings for that individual device. Next slide, please. We also have for our content, not, not all content has this, but we've, we've asked them to create for us XML Reflow, which allows users with smaller screens on your iPad, on your phone, um, to switch between a high quality layout view and a text only Reflow. So there's just a little button at the bottom of the screen that says text and you press it and it goes straight to just plain text and you scroll down all the way through from the beginning to the end of the text. Next slide, please. So Zinio is a fee-based service. JRD is available as individual articles for $7.99 for an individual paper. A one-year subscription is $59.99. And we have just opted into their new program, which is really cool, called ZPass. And any user can opt to get three magazine titles a month for $5 a month. 
you can switch them up. You can you don't have you're not stuck for a year with any particular title. So for the same price, sixty dollars as a subscription, when you're subscription to JRD, you can get three titles. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, <clears throat> JRD hard copy is also available through the government printing office bookstore for a fee, and that hard copy fee is one hundred thirty-three dollars a year, and you get shipped to you from the government printing office a hard copy of, of each issue of the journal. Um, we do not keep this money. This isn't money that, that stays with us. It goes back into the government um, printing office book sales program. So, but the point that's exciting is that there are people who are purchasing this content um, for the convenience of getting it where and when they want it. Um, I think the hard copy is probably individual subscribers, um, maybe in, in other countries. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. And next slide, please. This last slide is just to highlight that we are again in the forefront. Um, JRD is mentioned in this blog as the first federal government publication to appear on Zinio out of the Department of Affairs, the Journal of Rehabilitation Research and Development. So we were excited to get sort of a, a mention in, in the, the bigger world of things. And that is all I have. So I will turn my camera back on if there are any questions. Uh, it does not look like there are any questions. Nobody has a hand raised and nothing was typed in. Okay, thank you guys very much. Okay, one of the, before we go to the next section, one of the things I want to point out is this is a real transition for JRD. Um, like Marin mentioned, um, people are effectively purchasing containers, but what's more important is people are buying what is technically free content. Um, over the past couple of months, you might have noticed that you received with your hard copy, uh, postage paid return flyers indicating that if you wanted to still receive JRD hard copy, you needed to return these flyers. Uh, we've gotten somewhere around 300 response cards. So within the next 30 to 60 days, we will be transitioning our mail list yet once again. All institutions of higher learning as well as uh, medical institutions and things like that will remain, libraries, etc., will remain on the JRRD hard copy list as well as those people who have returned their response cards. For the people that did not return their response cards, um, if they request hard copy, they will first be directed to GPO and to Zinio. Um, and then, of course, on a case-by-case -case basis, we will back add people to the mailing list um, if they can present, you know, necessary reasons to be added back on. Um, one of the things that we're quite pleased with, and I'll talk about a little bit later at the end, is um, the strong impact this has had with respect to government savings and that we have now fully fulfilled the Efficiency in Spending Resolution Act that was mandated by the President so that we are not um, wasting government dollars by offering free content that is available online. Okay, at this point I'm going to turn the presentation over to Ken Frager, our Public Affairs Officer, to discuss our social media outreach. Hi there. Uh, hopefully you all can see me and hear me. Uh, I am Ken Frager. I'm the Public Affairs Officer for the Journal. And I'm going to talk about social media and how we're getting the word out about the articles that are in JRD uh, in sort of a way that is a bit unique. So we're not just targeting researchers, but the general population and veterans in particular. So I'm going to turn off my webcam. Uh, next slide, please, Hunter. One of the uh, interesting things uh, about working with JRD is we're receiving research from all over the place. And it's research that's uh, very important for veterans who are primary artists, uh, I'm sorry, our primary audience. But it's also research that's very relevant for the general population, uh, people who are 
uh, in need of rehabilitation uh, information. So when we're trying to get the word out, we want to let not just scientific publications know what we're doing, but also uh, publications like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the USA Today, uh, publications that are going to reach the general consumer. So it, it's a unique, it's a unique way to uh, to try to we, we need to find unique ways to try to get this information uh, out to people. With 12 articles in each journal uh, issue, uh, we've got a very small number of media outlets that really can understand and um, convey our stories and, and the, you know, the topics that we're covering. So we use uh, primarily Newswise, which is a, a uh, distribution service that focuses on science writers. Uh, when we send information out through Newswise, we're promoting an entire issue at one time, but we're, we're conveying the message in a, in a much more simplified manner. So we're simplifying the language, distributing it out that way, and then allowing them to contact the authors of the papers directly, rather than coming back through our office. Uh, it allows us a way, it, it, it expands our audience uh, to much more broad, uh, a much more broad reach. The other thing we're using is social media, in particular Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and then occasionally Flickr if there are uh, photos and images that we want to distribute. Uh, I found that, that Facebook and Twitter in particular are very popular among our veteran audience. Uh, people are coming to our site and they're, they're following us, they're linking to us, and they're asking to receive more information. We've been able to grow our audience in a way that is uh, it, it's, it's very friendly. We're, we're able to respond if they have questions. And in a time of fiscal constraint like Ren right now, uh, this is a very effective and efficient way to do this. Uh, we're not advertising. We're not um, spending money to get the word out about our Facebook page or our other social media sites. We're allowing word of mouth to do it. Uh, we're reaching veterans through the Creative Arts Festivals, through the National Summer, uh, National Veterans Summer Sports Clinic, and we're developing real close, I guess, closer relationships rather than just having people try to find us through the VA site directly. Uh, Hannah, next page. So right now on Facebook, which seems to be our most popular means of getting the information out, we've got more than a thousand likes. Likes are sort of, they're not really friends. We're not allowing uh, a lot of friends to connect directly to face, our Facebook page. Uh, when somebody's our friend, it means that they can not just read what we're posting, but they can also post things to our, our site. We don't really want to open it up for that, unless it's somebody that we're really comfortable with or we're confident that, that the information they're posting is going to be appropriate and uh, relevant for our audience. But when somebody likes our Facebook page, that means that they're allowing us to distribute our news and our articles and our information through their news feeds. So if we have, you know, if somebody has 10 friends, not only does our message get to the one person who's requesting it, but it also allows their 10 friends to see it. So it's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's a good way to spread the word. Uh, on Twitter, we're we're following, or we've got 106, approximately 160 followers. So that's, again, people who are reading our messages directly through Twitter. Uh, and those 160 followers have basically retweeted our messages 700 times. So they're sharing it with their friends who are then sharing it with their friends. So we're getting good distribution there. Uh, LinkedIn is something that you, many of you may be on, and we are accepting some friends on LinkedIn. Uh, because it's it's really a good way for professionals to communicate and to reach each other, uh, and also again to to reach an audience that's a, a little more uh, business focused or uh, professionally focused. Where I, I I seem I find that Facebook is more uh, more uh, maybe more interactive and more social, uh, but LinkedIn allows us to reach a more professional audience. So we're getting we're starting to build our following there as well. 
So NewsWise, as I said, is our only paid distribution service. We're posting about 15 times a year, and each of those posts are being viewed at least a thousand times. So I, you know, I, I think what we're doing, we, we, we can't really pr to, uh, promote an individual article because it's not really our place to do that. It's more of the place for the researchers directly and their institutions to promote their articles. But if we can draw people in, draw the media in, let them know that the information's there, uh, we can help to build uh, build the distribution that way. All right, uh, I think that's all I have. Comment, next slide. All right, are there any um, questions? Uh, no questions about what Ken has put up so far. Uh, Dr. Hafner wrote a question um, about, if, if Dave wants to get back on real quick, he says that uh, he has noticed that print versions of JRD are available prior to the online version. Typically, I observe online versions appear prior to print. Is the decision to release print versions first purposeful? Um, and I kind of tentatively answered that it's because we don't have immediate control over the website. We have to send everything to Austin. But um, if Dave wants to go ahead and comment more, that'd probably be cool. Yeah, um, that's partly correct, Connor. Um, because we're hosted in Austin, um, and because we're within the VA's firewall, anything we post has to be um, checked through, the, through their uh, security service to make sure that everything we're posting is um, proper, well, I guess, representative of the VA. Um, and because of that, there is sometimes a week to sometimes three to four days of a delay from when I request for the content that we have been, that we have prepared for the web to go up on the web. Um, like I said, sometimes that's five days, sometimes that's a week. Um, in addition to that, um, recently we've been um, making an effort to make all of the supplementary material that we have with each article ready at the exact same time to go live with the actual journal content itself that mirrors the print. Um, so in the last few months, that's the latest a bit, but we do believe that having everything packaged together and put up together um, increases the chance that people are going to look at everything. And then also, we don't like putting back issues up when there's something else. We like to have everything together. Um, I hope that answers your question. We try to uh, have it as close to when Dr. Hafner, I unmuted you just in case you wanted to say anything. No, I appreciate the elaboration. Thank you very much. I'll just add one more point to that, um, Bill, uh, Dr. Hafner. Um, the web, effectively, everything you see up on the web doesn't go into full swing production until the print has been delivered to the printing office. So once print is done, then everything you see up on the web plus everything you don't see up on the web i.e. everything that goes to Crossref, all the background XML, all the databases that populate what you see on the JRD website, all go into Swing um, immediately after by uh, Mr. Bartlinski and Mr. Rodney Baylor. So I only have two people um, who effectively do everything, and that includes all the podcasting, all the editing of the podcasting, all the audit glances, all of the individual um, PowerPoints that you see that go along with every figure, that's not done by the authors. That's all done by Mr. Bartlinski and Mr. Baylor. So there's a lot of background work that goes into this, so that is also has to be taken into account. Nevertheless, the date that the articles appear online is the official publication date for that particular volume and that volume. I hope that answers the question. Any others? Uh, Dr. Bernardi asked, uh, just to be clear, you aren't buying Facebook ads but are just running a Facebook page for the journal. Um, I responded that, yes, we just run a Facebook page. We don't, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, Ken, but I'm pretty sure that we don't buy the ads that show up on the sides of people's pages. Is Ken there? Ken has I'll answer that. We spend no money on Facebook at all. Yeah, that's what I figured. Um, no, so all of 
all of the Facebook dissemination. Um, we post content on our page and people can share it on their own pages. Uh, I, I don't know if you use Facebook yourself, but every post that shows up, um, especially if it links to a website or a picture, you can hit a little share button and then that shares it um, to everybody that you were personally friends with. Um, that's how we've gotten a lot of friends. That's what I was trying to say, but I couldn't unmute myself. I apologize. Any other questions, Hana? Nope, okay. that's it. We're going to go on um, to the next section. I'm going to turn off my webcam. Uh, Hana, can you go back one? Okay. In this section, we're going to talk about new initiatives. Um, during this last section of today's webinar, I will focus once again on the historical transition of STM publication, followed by ongoing and upcoming transitions in STM publishing and how it affects JRD and what JRD is doing about it. Next slide, please, Hana. In 1665, Henry Oldenburg created the first scientific journal that replaced letters between scientists. So this was effectively the transition according to the uh, Adams article that I mentioned early on in the talk of transitioning from the individual to the institution. After World War II, peer and editorial review became commonplace as a way to compile and enact community-based judgments on scientific contributions as a method of display and notification and within the last three decades recognition. This is effectively the, the transition from the institution to the national collaboration. In the mid-2000s, web scholarly dissemination became paramount and containers such as individual journals and publishing houses become much less relevant. If you don't believe me, ask any student. A lot of students don't even know that individual journals exist. Um, open access journals, data repositories, blog posts, interactive graphics, video, audio have shifted publication from a paper base to a web native system. And this is facilitating the transition from national collaboration to international collaboration. Um, we've seen this, and this has been borne out by the numbers presented by Mr. Bartlinski, the JRD webmaster. Indeed, not only the number of website downloads, but the fact that when he said that more people are coming to us through Google, and this is Google and Google Beta Scholar, um, than through any other mechanism, i.e. going online and searching to see what JRD has in its table of contents. Next page, please, Hannah. So what are the consequences of these transitions? Well, metrics have been used for quite a while to measure scientific output, and those metrics are now changing to something known as alternative metrics or altmetrics. Altmetrics include views in domain-specific web enterprises, mentions in social media, citations in open access journals like JRD, recommendations in social media such as LinkedIn or Faculty of a Thousand, as well as the standard citation indexes. Altmetrics, according to Science and Nature, who've run editorials on this over the past year to year and a half, will include products. This PowerPoint is a product, so you will have noticed that when there are slides with people's names on them, their researcher ID slash ORCID, which I will discuss more later, are on the bottom of those slides. Altmetrics will measure these products emerging from hypothesis-generated research rather than citation indexes alone. Once upon a time, and still to this day at some institutions, um, whether or not you made the rank of full professor depended in large part on your publication records, in which case they looked at the particular journals you published in. Journal metrics, i.e., um, the impact factor, were never designed to um, calculate or figure out an individual researcher's productivity or 
the reach that they had within the scientific community that they're, that they're in. Um, H index, um, as I mentioned previously, actually measures a person's citation proficiency as opposed to the impact factor. Impact factor is becoming less and less relevant as more and more people are getting away from the concept of the box as opposed to the individual article content. And finally, data, once the bailiwick of the individual or the collaborative group is going to be expected to become part of the public record because in the web age, scholarship leaves footprints. Um, recently, i.e. this week, Dr. Francis Collins from NIH just announced a $96 million investment over four years to put big data to work on solving persistent health issues. And those monies would be filtered through centers of excellence. This project is referred to as Big Data to Knowledge, or BD2K, and will ultimately will make large, complex, and unstructured data sets more accessible to researchers through software, better storage, and improved data sharing and training. And indeed, NIH has already partnered with Amazon in March to put 1,000 human genomes on Amazon's EC2 computer cloud, where researchers can analyze that data on a fee-for-use basis, effectively to democratize access, which previously been held by only a handful of public private sector labs. Again, this gets back to the fact that um, scholarship leaves footprints and data is no longer yours. Next slide, please. So I'm going to now discuss the anticipated anticipatory measures to be adopted by JRD. Next slide, please. This year, JRD has joined FundREF and CHORUS. OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, under the White House, under the direction of John Holdren, has mandated in February of this year that all federally funded peer-reviewed papers are to be freely available within 12 months of publication. Previously, this only applied to NIH funded, and that is why we have PubMed Central. JRD is currently in PubMed, and we are working to become part of PubMed Central, so those authors that submit to us papers that have NIH funding will no longer have to submit the papers to PubMed Central themselves so that they can check, on those box, check off those boxes on their grant applications that they have successfully done. This is requiring us to significantly change our post-production flow and go over to an XML workflow, um, but we are actively pursuing that and we hope that uh, we will have uh, completed that transition to this XML-based workflow by 2014. So what is FundREF and what is CHORUS? In an answer by the STM publication community, they were trying to figure out a way to meet these federally mandated guidelines for all publishers. FunREP is a response from the STM publication community at large to provide a way to index papers by federal grant numbers that support the work. In practical terms, this will work like the digital object identifiers that are already on all JRD publications and will be part of the JRD submission upload process, part of the final production, and eventually reported to Crossroad. Eventually, APIs, which are application program interfaces, will be created across the private and public sectors in response to FundRef which will allow interested agencies or other stakeholders to determine the relation between grant dollars and publication output. So what is CHORUS? Well, CHORUS is an STM publishing response to handle this OSTP mandate without creation of yet another large database and without expenditures of additional government funds. It is, CHORUS stands for the Clearinghouse for Open Research of the United States. In practical terms, this is going to build on the DOI, the Digital Object Identifier, Fund Ref Identifiers, and Orchid Researcher IDs, which I'll discuss a little bit further on, 
and utilizes these existing databases to provide a public-private partnership to fulfill the OSTP mandate. Even though JRD is online and freely accessible from day one with no embargoes, nevertheless, we felt it was important to become part of this database so as not to be left out, because eventually this database then I can proceed in the future to be utilized for other things. Next slide, please. There was a news release last week from Crossref, who maintains the DOI database, that in order to help correct funding, connect funding and publication to improve public access, the announcement of FundRef. And they say here that the registry will include 4,000 worldwide funder names, um, and the VA is currently part of that funder names database. Next slide, please, Hanna. Furthermore, this initiative will allow readers to easily and freely access peer-reviewed publications that result from funding provided by U.S. government agencies. There's been a lot of talk within the scientific community about people who do research that aren't necessarily affiliated with established labs, student scientists, things like that. And overall, the, the overarching message that, um, that I've taken from these articles is that people that are able to access government-funded research are much, much happier than having to figure out how to get through publisher paywalls or the $30 pay-per-views or anything else. A lot of times, if a researcher who is not within an institution that has access to a particular journal comes across a paywall of some sort, that article will be ignored. It will be neglected. It won't be reviewed by the particular scientist doing the work. And that, in some way, impedes the overall progress of science. Next slide, please. In addition, JRD has joined Rubric. Rubric is a commercial enterprise. We have joined Rubric at no cost to JRD. So why and what is Rubric? Rubric is a, is a, is a new, new process that's out there that provides rapid, double-blinded peer review with a standardized score sheet. It's an author pays model. You pay 600 bucks because reviewers are compensated 100 bucks and they're expected to return their review in a one-week turnaround. Again, I said this is a standardized score sheet. It is not going to be looking for particulars about the hypothesis-generated research. What does the author get? Well, they obtain the standardized score sheet review they get an Authenticate re report, so they don't put the $50 out for the Authenticate report. A ORCID or researcher, I well, in this case it's ORCIDs, which is the same, similar to a researcher ID, are assigned if necessary. And again, that feeds back into the H index. And recommendations are given to the authors for best fits journals. So what does JRD stand to gain from this? Well, JRD will become a rubric recommended journal for anybody who chooses to submit their papers into rubric. And JRD will also accept rubric reviews uh, as part of the JRD review process, which can be shared with managers such as yourself and other reviewers if requested because they're fully anonymized. Um, and because JRD is likely to be part of the recommendation package provided by rubric, we hope to obtain then um, authors who may or may not know about JRD. Next slide, please, Hannah. Another measure that we're going to be implementing towards the end of this year with full implementation in 2014 is where we're following the lead of the top tier journals. And in this case, it's Nature and BMJ, uh, British Medical Journal. This is, this is related to increased data transparency and reproducibility endeavors. Over the past six months, 
Nature has run a complete series of articles on data transparency and reproducibility errors measured within primarily clinical and biomedical research. So they have suggested and now mandated in their policies that two things happen. Number one, that if requested of a researcher, that the researcher provides relevant anonymized patient level data if requested. The second, the second change in their editorial policies involves something that they're calling uh, additional data. We're calling it supplemental data. For that, any time that you see a figure or graph in JRD, there will be a link in the web-only version that will provide online tables of data behind the graphs and figures. On the right, you see our uh, table of contents, our TOC uh, legend. And these are all the little things that we offer in terms of supplementary content. At the very bottom, you see one that says supplemental data. So in a TOC of an article, if you see that, you will know that there is data that accompanies graphs and figures. Next slide. This request is backed by VA Directive 0005 entitled Scientific Integrity, which first appeared in the Federal Register on 11-08-2012. And in this, in Section 5, Foundation of Scientific Integrity, subsection B, it states, to the extent practicable, practicable, VA will expand and promote access to the scientific and technological information underlying its policies and making such information available online and in open formats. As appropriate, this will include data, research citations, and models underlying regulatory proposals and policy decisions. So therefore, data starting in 2014 that accompany figures will need to be included. Next slide, please, Hannah. I've been talking a lot about researcher ID in ORCID. Researcher ID was originally a proprietary nomenclature by Thomson Reuters. There, Thomson Reuters is the, is the parent organization behind Web of Science and journal citation reports and things like that. Um, but in order to maximize the use of this nomenclature and to be able to have it fully utilized for FundRef and Chorus, it was decided by the STM community to merge them and now it's referred to as Researcher ID slash ORCID. Um, earlier this year, we adopted that linkage, but I just wanted to point out to all of you uh, what this identifier means and why the members of my copy editing team asked this of you. Um, we're not asking it to just to give you one more thing to think about or do. We're asking this because this is actually very beneficial to you and your students to have this. Using this identifier, research can manage their publication profile. And once upon a time, that used to be done by your CBA or resume, but not anymore. They can manage their product profile, like this PowerPoint, or anything else you publish or do, or your videos, or your audio. You can track your citations. And finally, one of the most important things that we consider to be useful of this particular nomenclature is identify potential collaborators from around the globe as they come to you or you can go to them. Next slide, please. In 2003, JRD had no editorial policies or guidelines outside of VA Handbook 1203.05. 1203.05, entitled Journal of Rehab Research and Development, um, described G JRD operational details and reporting mechanisms rather than editorial policies and procedures. Because of this, JRD examined top-flight STM journals for their policies, 
attended STM journal conferences and meetings, and carefully put together a compilation of the current and most comprehensive best practice utilized by these top-tier journals, most, much of which we adopted and put into our own, our own code and our own policies. This was done to provide JRD stakeholders with a clear and consistent set of guidelines for submission, review, plagiarism, conflict of interest, clinical trial registration details, technical editing and why we technically edit, publishing practices, dissemination methods, etc. Now we have this policy and we pretty much update it every year so we consider it to be an evolving policy that reflects the most current STM thinking. In 2013, there were two, two significant additions to our policy. COPE, which stands for Committee on Publication Ethics, is an international collaboration of STM journals and we are a member of COPE. And COPE put together ethical guidelines for peer reviewers, which we have incorporated. COPE also put together a code of conduct and best practice guidelines for journal editors. They're not only talking about people like myself, they're talking about people like those of you participating in today's webinar, and I'll get into that a little bit more. In addition, we incorporated the VA Scientific Integrity Policy, which I, Directive 005, which I, previously rec, which I previously referenced, and I'll speak more about that. The next round of revision will add the supplemental data descriptions and submission details, the process for requesting and providing anonymized patient level data, the fund ref requirements and submission details, as well as rubric and course information. Next slide, please, Hannah. This is the uh, COPE guidelines for peer reviewers, and I'm not going to read this slide to you. You can take a look at it if you'd like. But basically, it's a, a whole bunch of common sense kind of things that you'd like to see in a review. It's something that I think should, is best shared with students and with postdocs and with interns so that they have a basic understanding of what the peer review process should and should not contain. Next slide, please, Hannah. I am going to read you this slide because this is directly relevant to what we all do every day. For you all, when you think about providing me with reviewer suggestions or recommendations, the conduct and the and best practices for journal editors, which includes all of you editorial board members, um, like I said, is involved with the review process, providing recommendations, or even talking amongst yourselves about a particular article or with me. Generally, editors should strive to meet these responsibilities. You strive to meet the needs of readers and authors. Oftentimes, um, you'll come to me and you'll say, I don't think this is the best fit for JRRD and we'll have a discussion, or I think this belongs in another journal, this doesn't really meet the needs of the JRRD stakeholders, and that's very valid. We have to continue to strive to continually improve our journal. We have to work at improving the reviews by ranking the reviews when they come into you, by providing me with estimates on the quality of the reviews. We have to have processes in place to assure the quality of the material they publish, and we do through our editorial policies. We have to champion freedom of expression, and we have to maintain the integrity of the academic record. We have to preclude business needs from compromising intellectual and ethical standards. And finally, we always have to be willing to publish corrections, clarifications, retractions, and apologies. Up until this point in time, we've never had to do a perigium which I'm very happy about, and we've never had to uh, publish a retraction. Um, we work very hard, and that's one of the reasons we uh, put into place Authenticate, so that we don't run into some of those problems. Although, if the problem ever exists, we have the editorial policies in place to guide us with doing those processes. Next slide, please. Additionally, the VA directive part provides two parts of interest which bear on these previous discussions. 
The first, which was of great pleasure to all of us at JRD under Section 5, Foundations of Scientific Integrity, um, subsection C, part D, states, publication in the Journal of Rehabilitation Research and Development, which covers an area of particular interest to veterans and key veteran organizations, was recognized. We were very pleased to be part of this, of this um, directive. Next slide. The second part of interest, which is directly related, related to all of you who are on my editorial board who work for the VA, again, under professional development of VA science technology experts, Section A, Part 1, it encourages the publication of VA scientific and technological findings in peer-reviewed professional or scholarly journals, and encourages VA employees to become editors or editorial board members of professional or scholarly journals. So congratulations to all of you. You're meeting your directives. Next slide, please. To begin to wrap up today's webinar, I'm going to again turn to Dr. Francis Collins at NIH. He was recently asked to provide commentary on leadership in the federal system. And when I read his commentary, I realized that much of what he said is what the JRID team is all about and why we can report to you so successfully today on everything then and now. It is what we do and why we can report this with pride. We've come far and we've and with your help, we've helped turn JRD into an international rehabilitation publication powerhouse. Next slide, please. He starts with saying, have the right team. I have the best team imaginable. I'm surrounded by intelligent, hardworking, insightful, cooperative people who are never, ever afraid to tell me if I'm wrong. Believe me. They do, a lot. Number two, allow people to grow and they'll surprise you. At JRD, we encourage, I encourage and we encourage each other for ongoing education. There is little within the VA system that can truly help us stay ahead of the publication curve because we're the only publication enterprise within the VA. So the team takes it upon itself to ferret out low or no cost educational opportunities, including online meetings, webinars, and MOOCs, which is massive open online courses. If you have never checked out the MOOCs, you really, really should. It's really fascinating, all the different types of educational programs, college level, graduate level courses that are out there for free. Encourage risk taking. We take calculated risk at JRD. We look at what the top tier journals are doing and what works for them, and then within the context of our own budget, we try new things, and as you've seen from Mr. Bartlinski's talk, these new things have been wildly successful. Number four, connect everybody to the mission. We're a vertically integrated publication enterprise. What does that mean? It means we do everything in-house except for the print and Zinio. We do everything. This is in direct contrast to a lot of other journals. I worked at Wiley for almost 10 years. And at Wiley, while I ran the journal, I was the managing editor for the journal, I had no control over anything outside of the peer review process. At JRD, it's totally different. Every member of the JRD team plays an integral and ongoing part of the process. We're all connected to each other and dependent on the hard work and continuing efforts of other members of the team. If one fails, we all fail. So we're very connected. Number five, pursue a calling, not just a job. The JRD team creates a product, which is helpful to people in 190 some countries. And we work it because we know we're making a difference. We've gotten emails, we've gotten letters from people who've told us thank you. These aren't other researchers, these are people. We see it on our Facebook, the people that connect to us. We see it from our veterans. Number six, be realistic about government service. Today we are presenting this webinar from our respective homes. 
because of those of you in the audience who work for the VA, realize or in other government organizations, other parts of government, sometimes sectors of government service do not necessarily jive well with the needs of a particular service. So we try to stay creative and positive to legally and within guidelines accomplish our unique mission. And finally, number seven, never forget you have the opportunity to change the world. This is the most important thing for us. We are changing the world. One country, one veteran, one person at a time. We're giving people around the world access to research that they may not necessarily have any other way to get. We're creating a platform for open dissemination of cutting edge research to beneficiaries here and abroad, especially those veterans in the foreign fee program, as well as international, the international rehab community. Hopefully our endeavors will also provide utility to all research stakeholders to provide them with international collaborative opportunities. Next slide, please. So, I want to thank all of you who are participating today from the board. This is really, really important work you do for us. And most of you do it of your free time and your own volition and we couldn't do it without you. We thank you for your untiring assistance. We'd also like to thank our support above us, ORD, RRD, Dr. Patricia Doran, the RRD Service Chief, for the, her unwavering support. Next slide, please. In summary, JRD continues to improve in content, quality, delivery, and outreach. We've begun the transition to a fee-based publication. As I mentioned before, research libraries and other institutions will maintain their hard copy subscription for free, but we will try, and again this is try, um, to push people towards GPO or Zinio or to our complete web. JRD stays current on regulation and publication trends. We continue to experiment with alternate modalities for dissemination, and we continually strive to be frugal and resourceful with VA dollars. As a side note, um, all of our publication, our hard copy print, comes through our GPO contract with a GPO printer. Previously, our GPO contract exceeded 300,000 per year. But this past year, due primarily to post-production enhancements that the team and I implemented, as well as reduced hard copy, our GPO contract was reduced to under 100 k We saved over $200,000 in one year. We're working hard to be resourceful with VA dollars while striving to provide a 21st century experience. And that's all I have to say. Thank you all for listening, and we will now open up for questions. Can all of my presenters, if able, put on your webcams? Uh, no questions have been typed in, and it doesn't look like anybody's hand is raised, but we should probably give it a few minutes just in case anybody is typing. Okay. Ah, Nancy Bernardi, I'm going to unmute you, ma'am. Thank you. And Stacy, um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Congratulations. This looks wonderful. And since it's my first year, it's really great to get this history and see what you've been able to do. Would you mind commenting on how selections are made about um, special or single topic issues and what is in line in that regard? OK. So on the JRD website, we have a section with single topic issues. And so the way this usually comes about is uh, an author, usually a researcher, comes to me with an idea or to Mr. Tinker with an idea. One of the first things we do is we take a look and see whether or not we've published anything within this particular arena as a single topic issue in the past. Secondly, we take a look at what we published within the past 12 to 15 or so months to see whether or not those kind of articles have drawn any significant interest. Then what we do is we work with the author 
of now this person now effectively becomes the editor of the issue <laughs> to figure out whether or not number one the articles would be of interest to the wide the wide stakeholders that come to JRRD number two whether or not the editor will be able to pull together the articles that would be necessary for a single topic issue and we tried to get anywhere between 12 and 15 articles for a single topic issue and then number three whether or not the potential authors would be willing to abide by the fairly stringent, and again, this is important, the fairly stringent timelines to pull this together. Too often what happens in single topic issues is things get delayed, and publications that have, would have occurred in a more timely fashion in a multi-topic JRD publication get strung out of it. So those are sort of our criteria, but um, Mainly what we do is we try to take a look at what's trending um, within the rehabilitation community, make sure that no other, none of our other competitors have published something similar recently, um, and to make sure that what we're publishing is novel. That helps. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, Dr. Sherwood asked if we would be sending a link to this presentation, and I responded to him, but let me tell everybody that um, both a copy of the PowerPoint that you all saw and a recording of all of us speaking actually will um, be posted online. Yes, that's absolutely correct. It may take a little while, but um, it, the, the entire uh, presentation, like Hannah said, will be online, and you all, all the editorial board members, as well as everybody participating in this meeting today, will receive a copy of that link. Okay, uh, Dr. Levitt says, I find it mind-boggling that you could reduce expenses by two-thirds. Congratulations. Thanks, Harry. Um, Dr. Bell says, growth of the journal's impact is very gratifying to see. Congratulations to all of you. Thanks, Morris. Um, one of our editors, uh, Rebecca Torres, says, how would rubric affect the JRD review process? Okay. At this point, we can't answer that question definitively because um, what will have to happen is the author will have to choose to go into rubric and pay, and pay the $600, and then the author will have to choose to share their rubric score sheet with us. We cannot ask for the score sheet. But if the author chooses to share the score sheet, that will be disseminated to the managing editor. And then the managing editor then, in collaboration with me, will decide whether or not to share it with the other reviewers. Please note that the rubric score sheet, like I said, is a standardized score sheet. So it won't necessarily reflect um, a lot of the things we are looking for within the rehabilitation community. Um, it'll say, is this a standard scientific article? Um, does it contain? an abstract, you know, things like that. But to be fair, we've recently had to add to the JRRD um, submission instructions as well as to the reviewer score sheet, does this article contain an abstract introductions, methods, you know, results and conclusion sections? Because even though we consider those to be standard items for a research article, many times research articles come in without those requisite headings. Okay, uh, Dr. Levitt says, this has been the most interesting and informative board meeting that I have attended. My only wish is that we could have met in person. I hope this will be the case next year. Us too, Harry. Uh, Dr. Sherwood asks, will, the, will this set up some union-tended publication bias? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question, Art. Um, Dr. Sherwood, I'm going to unmute you. I don't know if you have a microphone. So if you, if you want to rephrase that or elaborate it, I'll. OK, am I there? Yep. We Hi, Art. You. Hi. I, I, I'm sorry, the, the uh, typing correction on my iPad changed my wording. I, the, I wondered if there was unintended bias created by use of this uh, external review tool so that someone who can afford the $600 would then somehow get a slight leg up in getting their stuff published? No, I don't think so. Again, it's just going to be one more piece of the puzzle, and it will not provide them with any uh, 
an incentive or will not provide them with any advantage as best as I can see. Primarily what the reason that we joined Rubric, like I said, is so that if people come in with rehabilitation content and don't really know where they want to publish or what's the best, best pace, place for them to publish, that um, Rubric will recommend us. But I do not see it in any way uh, affecting our peer review process. Hey, Art, how's Prague? Oh, uh, it's great. <laughs> that it is. Okay, um, I don't want to forget, uh, we should go back to Dr. Triolo's question about impact factor. Do you want me to return to that slide? Yes. Okay. So Ron, I do believe you asked me what the impact of international collaboration is on the increasing impact factor. And to be honest with you, I can't answer that question directly. And I'm not even sure if within the context of the search parameters that are available in, to me via Manuscript Central, if I can accurately tease that out or not. However, this is what I can, I can find out. Um, one of the things that you can tell through Web of Science, which due to technical difficulties we don't technically have access to at this point in time, you can figure out uh, citations coming in and going out of a particular article and how, um, what journals those are and where in terms of globally in the world where they are. And uh, once we have our Web of Science access back, I will be able to tease that out a little bit better and get back to you to, to determine how much that is impacting the JRD impact factor. Uh, let me go ahead and unmute Dr. Trillo just in case you wanted to say anything. You are unmuted, sir. Okay, thanks, Stacy. That's helpful. I guess, you know, uh, it's a brave new world with uh, all these new metrics and um, thinking outside our little boxes, but um, still at least helpful for me to know how we stack up compared to uh, our competitors, if you want to think in terms of sure. you know, the APM and R and PT and the mm -hmm. all of neural engineering and rehab. Um, mm -hmm. So this old way of thinking is still useful, especially as I uh, advise people about where to submit. Um, okay. So the impact factor is still something I think people understand and, and kind of latch on to. Uh, I guess the other critical thing, and I might have missed this when my network went down, but um, another factor in people's uh, decisions on where to publish is the, the turnaround time from submission to uh, publication. and. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you summarized that in... No, I did not. How, how are we stacking up, you know, in, in that metric internally? In okay. To, to kind of get back to a little bit, I mean, one of the things I can never, ever know is, uh, while I share all of this with you, um, and we're open access, so all of this is obviously shared on my website, uh, the JRD website, um, information regarding... Um, as you phrased it, our competitors uh, is not something I can easily access. So I can't know, you know, how many downloads they get or any. I can know their impact factors and I can know that sort of stuff based on the JCR information, but a lot of the other sort of information that leads up to this, I cannot find out. And even through Web of Science, it's very difficult for me to find out. Now, to answer the question about timelines, which is effectively what you're asking. Um, in general, it takes um, six weeks to three months to get an article through the first round of peer review. I will tell all of you, and a lot of you probably noticed this lately, and it always gets more onerous during the summer months, 
is that once upon a time you were asked to provide two or three reviewer names. Now sometimes Mr. Tinker or I are coming back to you and saying, uh, how about a few more names? I think my all-time high now is 18 reviewers were queried for one particular paper till we got two. It's, it's getting more and more difficult. And indeed, in my conversations with other edit, editors and editorial board members, this seems to be uh, an overall general complaint. And it's to be expected because journals are proliferating um, and the amount of time that you're being asked to spend in the peer review process or in some part of the peer review process is increasing while the compensation has re remained steady or non-existent. Um, so that being said, it's, it's about three months. We give people uh, 60 or 90 days to return um, their first round revision. Most usually take most of that time. A lot of papers after the first revision have to undergo a, a second round revision. So the typical length of time for a paper to get through the first round of review and the subsequent revisions is more or less on average about six months. Right now, as of this morning actually, Mr. Tinker completed um, volume 50-10, the last issue for this year, and these are papers that went through the end of June. So it is now taking six months or thereabout to get published from once you are accepted. That being said, because our um, copy editing and post-production process is somewhat more lengthy than other journals, people actually start to receive queries from Marin's team probably starting three months out because we, we work on several issues at a time and we discussed this in the past, we tend to work on three issues concurrently, different levels depending on where we are. So we just got 50-5 uh, is going to the printer, we're also working on 50-6 and 50-7 concurrently. So to answer you, um, I would like to see the time from acceptance to production shrunk from six months down to four months. That'll put us more on edge, but will allow for more rapid turnaround times. And in order to accomplish that for the next year, I have decided to forego for 2014 publication of any single topic issues to effectively allow us a catch-up time. That being said, in 2014, we will again begin um, to look at requests for single topic issues as they come in, but currently for 2014 there are no single topic issues on the book because remember we published 12 articles times 10 um, plus or minus a few per issue and um, I have a very limited number uh, of people working on my production team. So I really, really can't go much beyond that while maintaining the quality that people have come to expect from JRD. Have I answered the question? Um, I think Dr. Giolo had more problems because he's offline again. Oh, who? <laughs> I think he got most of that, though. Uh, okay. Sandra Gabelli says, have you thought requesting at the time of submission for six suggested reviewers to increase the chance to have an expedited review. Yes, Dr. Cabela, yes, we have thought about that. Currently, everybody is supposed to give two. I can't tell you how many of our authors come in and give zero. Um, again, um, we, we do not have the capacity within Manuscript Central to make this a mandatory fill field. Um, but that is something, um, Marin, please make a note of that and perhaps we can change that up for 2014. That is a good suggestion. Because there are plenty of times that um, we end up having to query um, the suggested reviewers. Please note that the suggested reviewers more often than not decline. Um, but more suggestions are helpful. I will also extend it out there that uh, several of you have come to me within the past couple of weeks last month for some um, tutoring on utilizing the Manuscript Central um, process to be able to provide reviewer suggestions. Remember I said we have over 5,000 people. And while that is true, utilizing the conventional Boolean search operators, you may not be able to ferret out people 
that have reviewed for JRD in the past, but I have a couple tricks up my sleeve that allow us to pull people out who might, by either accident or on purpose, have declined to put their areas of expertise in there so they can't be searched. We do have other ways of searching for these people, and if you would like to know these little tricks of the trade, please feel free to contact me um, sometime the end of this week or next week, and we can set up a personalized tutorial session so I can guide you through that process. Any more questions, Hana? Uh, nobody's hand is raised and nothing else has come in. Well, we're at uh, 2 hour, uh, two hour 2.55 right now, um, coming up on the close of our meeting. Um, I want to thank you all very, very much for participating. I'd like to thank all of my presenters today um, for their very interesting talks. And I welcome any feedback from any of you. Again, um, once this is available online, um, the entire product will be available and you will receive an email telling you. I look forward to getting any feedback at all. And thank you for your time and your participation today. Hannah, will you close the meeting? Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I am going to shut it down right now. Bye. Bye. Bye.